Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Chris from Paint and Glory, and a while ago I posted a video on how to paint World War I Germans. Similar to World War II Germans, a couple of minor differences, um, but that video was not filmed, it was kind of a progression of photographs, so I wanted to do an update here. I have a couple of new World War I Germans uh, in Feldmutzes, they're uh, brimless field caps, and so I want to go from this to this. Step one, of course, is always going to be prime. Now, you'll notice I've primed this in white. I purchased these figures secondhand. They were already primed black. Now, the debate about black versus white versus gray primer is as old as painting itself. I recommend white. I like white. I like my highlights to be very bright. I like my contrast to be uh, a lot of contrast, and so I find it easier to achieve a lot of contrast going off a white primer. Of course, with Germans, you are painting a lot of dark colors, the infamous Feld Grau, the Field Gray, neither gray nor green, but both and neither. Um, so you could go with a gray primer, um, light gray, medium gray, dark gray, whatever you want. I would personally recommend against pure black, because it, especially with the skin, it's going to be hard to get up to that skin color, but you could if you wanted to. Now, the first color we're going to go from here is the color that's going to cover most of the miniature, and that is Feldgrau, or Field Gray. So, I usually don't say go and buy paint that is a specific paint for what you are painting, but in the case of World War I Germans, or if you paint World War II Germans, Vallejo model color German Field Gray World War II is really going to be a lot easier than trying to mix your own ratios of green and gray. There is an army painter color also called field gray. There's also an army color painter color called filthy cape, which is a little greener, but also works because there's really no one designated field gray across World War I or World War II. So our first step, and we can be a little messy in this because we're going to go back and clean up later on, is we're going to go in and just hit all the uniform and if you get a little bit on his bandoliers here or on his rifle, that's okay. The only place I'm going to say you should try to avoid getting the field gray is his skin because then you'd be covering a dark greenish gray color with a lighter color. Not impossible, but it's just a bit more of a pain in the butt to clean up. You notice again, I said I primed in white. This is the Zenithal Prime. You can see the black underneath because these figures did come to me black. And I did not want to overly prime them and start to lose some of that detail. Zenithel can also be a good job where you do a prime of black and then a prime of white on top of it, just covering kind of the top of the figure, because then it's going to help bring out highlights at higher points in the figure and darkness down in the shadows where the white primer didn't quite reach. So I'm going to cover this figure up. I'm also going to be painting a couple other figures with some uh, various other accoutrements, backpacks, canteens, etc. Um, and we'll come back after I put a coat or two onto this fellow. Now that we have all the field gray uniform done, we're going to go in and we're going to do the webbing and the boots. Now this particular figure doesn't have a lot of webbing. He has a belt. He's wearing a bandolier instead of ammo pouches, so we'll be painting those in a khaki color. But his belt and his boots are going to be black. Now, I recommend not going straight to a pure black. I would go with a very, very dark gray. I'll have a list of my colors down in the description, but I'm going to be using Necromancer Cloak from the Army Painter. But also, I believe uh, German Gray from... Vallejo is also good for this. If you want a little variety, a lot of the leather webbing in the German military in World War One, I, I don't want to say a lot, but intermittently was also just a brown leather. But so I'm going to mix it up and about half of my figures are going to be in black and half of them are going to be in brown. Although the boots are all going to be black, it's the webbing that I'm going to switch up. You'll definitely want to get a bit of a fine tip brush for the belt although you can go back in and fix up any mistakes on the field gray. This is also why we didn't have to be too precise with the field gray. It's really easy to cover the field gray with this black. And so we're gonna work on all of this black and then come back and start working on some of the other accessories. 
Now the last step here before we apply our wash is only because we're using figures with Feldmutze. If we were using figures with the Stahlhelm helmets of World War I, then I would go with a slightly different green. I've used US dark green in the past, but any sort of medium dark green that's not your Feldgrau would work perfectly fine. So the helmets look a little bit different. You could use Feldgrau in a pinch. The Feldmutze were going to be Feldgrau on the top, but then there is a band underneath kind of the, the, where the brim would attach, the part that's above the, the head, the forehead, um, that is a color. Now I've seen a variety of different colors, but the most common I've seen is kind of a medium-ish bright green. I'm gonna be using goblin green right here. This is where you want a brush with a nice fine tip. It doesn't necessarily need to be your tiniest brush as long as it has a nice fine tip. And we need to go in and just the area underneath the floppy part is going to be this brighter green. Doesn't really matter if you get this on the face, but I'll try to avoid the top of the hat so I don't have to go back and fix it. After this dries, we'll talk washes. So now that we have all of the initial coats down of certain darker colors, like the field green, the black, and for these particular figures, also the green band around their field cap. We're gonna go in with a wash, a dark wash for these colors. We're gonna do other washes for some other things. So I'm gonna be using the Army Painter Dark Tone, uh, Nuln Oil from Games Workshop would work too, but I don't want it to be quite that dark. So I'm gonna take the edge off it a little bit with a mix, uh, mixing medium. You could use water, but this helps maintain the wash properties a little bit. I'm using a roughly, I'd say, uh, two or three parts wash to one part medium. Um, it doesn't need to be super precise. And then you're gonna just kind of slop it on there. You can try to avoid the areas we haven't painted so far, but since we're gonna go over them later, it's not the end of the world if you get them on there. And just make sure it doesn't pull up too much in the recesses. We kind of draw it away if it has any weird puddles. And once you apply this, give it about an hour to dry. And then we'll come back and we'll start hitting the other non-black washed areas, uh, the, the, the browns, the tans, etc. Now our next step is to do a couple of miscellaneous random earth tone colors or skin colors on the figures. So depending on what your figure has, for example, this figure has some bandoliers. So those are going to be painted in in khaki. I particularly like the German camo beige color. Um, you could also go with a skeleton bone color. For example, this figure has both a bedroll, which would be in khaki, and a bread bag, which would also be in khaki. But for variety, I like to paint them different colors. You also get the canteens. Those are usually in a light brown with a black strap. Um, the rifle in some sort of brown, like reddish brown, like fur brown. The skin in whatever skin tone that you particularly like. I'll be using barbarian flesh, a nice medium skin tone, and then we'll be washing that later. So we've got a couple of little things to do around these figures, and then we'll come back. We'll talk about what wash to put over the non-dark areas, and then also how to highlight them. Now that we've done almost all the painting, except the metallics, we'll leave that for last, we're gonna apply a wash to the earth tone or tan areas. Now we have a couple of different choices on what we wanna do. We could do a strong tone or an agrax earth shade, a flesh wash, uh, or you could try to split the difference and use a soft tone. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use strong tone on all of the areas that are khaki or tan, like the bandoliers here, or on some of the other figures their bedrolls. And then I'm going to use the flesh wash on all of the flesh, but also I'm going to use it on the rifle so it doesn't go too brown. It's still got a bit of a reddish tint to it. Again, if you wanted to split the difference, if you had a sep um, like a serif and sepia or a soft tone, you could use this for all of the areas. I'm also going to recommend using a relatively fine tip brush. Don't just glop this on there. Uh, we want to try to get this just where we want it to go not on the uniform if we can avoid it because we've already washed the uniform and we're just going in with some select washes on certain areas. So once this is applied and dried, we'll come back, we'll talk about the metallics, we'll talk about highlights, and we'll also talk about epaulette colors.
While we're waiting for the washes to dry, one thing that we can do is we can start working on the epaulettes. Now there's a lot of different epaulette colors for the Germans in World War One. I'll post a resource down below, but what we're gonna go for is the basic infantry had an, a white or a slightly off-white epaulette uh, edging around the field gray uh, of the actual epaulette or shoulder board or whatever, whatever you wanna call it. Um, so I'm going to be using Army Painter's Mummy Robe, but any sort of ever so slightly off-white or ivory would work perfectly fine. Even if you just had a white and you mix it in with just a the tiniest, tiniest touch of gray or brown, that would be perfectly fine. Make sure that you get, make sure you get a brush with a very fine tip here. And we're going to go, don't go directly at it, kind of go at it from the side and drag it along the side. And you see the edge comes out pretty well. It's gonna look a little chunky compared to real life. In real life, this was a very thin, but of course this is 28 millimeters. So if we actually scaled this down to 156 scale, it would be almost invisible. When that dries, you might have to do a second coat. And then one thing to really make it pop is I take a little bit of pure white when I'm done here and dab the pure white into just the corners. I'm gonna go back and clean up that little bit of blob there also. We'll wait for all of this to dry, we'll do the metal. So the last step before we do the highlights is to do metal uh, wherever it belongs, mostly the gun, but a couple of other places. This figure doesn't have any uh, visible buttons as far as we can see, uh, but some of the other figures I do have do have uh, buttons on the sleeves, or sometimes you can see buttons on the shirt or um, on their bread bags. Um, so you'll have to look for those. Uh, there are also buttons on the epaulettes that you can see. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a mix of uh, gunmetal because I'm not gonna wash this, so I want it to be quite dark to begin with. I'm gonna take gunmetal and then I'm gonna mix in, you can mix in a little black if you want, but I'm gonna mix in steel, which is a Vallejo metal color. This is a very thin airbrush paint. It is, I think, the best metallic color that you can get. Uh, very small metal flakes. It's not particularly goopy, especially because it's for air uh, airbrushing. And do not thin this with water. Water and metallics do strange things when they mix. And then you're gonna get a very, very dark steel color and then carefully apply this to the gun. Try not to get it on the areas that we've already painted and washed. And then again, on the areas like the epaulets, just a little boop. That might even be too dark. I might have to lighten this up a little bit. Um, and then once we're done with the metal, we will talk highlighting that nice big green canvas. So now we begin the highlighting stage, and we're going to begin by highlighting the most important part, and that is the field gray uniform. Now there's two ways you can do this. The long way that I think is going to give you a slightly better result, and the shorter way, which can still look good. The shorter way is you're going to take your German field gray, and then you're going to mix it with a little bit of a light gray, or I personally like this green gray because it helps maintain the green a little bit, and then you're going to cover about 50% of the uniform that's already been darkened down by the black wash with your mix of field gray with just a touch of a lighter gray to taste. That's what you could do. If you want to do it the slightly longer way, we're going to start with just pure field gray, and we're going to cover about 75% of the existing uniform. Anything that is not recessed in the shadows, the folds of this elbow here, I'm not gonna do the underside of the arm. We're gonna do most of the exposed uniform. Now it looks very light right now, but when it dries, it's going to dry darker because as it dries, it's less glossy. The shininess reflects the light, so it makes it look brighter than it really is. And also as it dries, it's gonna become more transparent and allow that darker color underneath to come through a little bit. So it's not gonna look quite as bright as it is now. If you want it to look kind of like that when you're done, then you actually wanna mix in a little bit of that lighter gray or lighter green gray first. So I'm gonna do this. 
we're going to come back and I'm going to show you the second step. Now our last step with the uniform is to highlight it. I have it back to its field gray base uh, with about 25% of the deeper area shadowed thanks to our wash, but we need to bring up the highlights a little bit because otherwise it's going to little bit look a little bit drab from far away. So I'm going to start with my field gray base and then I'm going to mix in just a little bit, just a little bit because it goes a long way, of this Vallejo green gray. If you don't have access to Vallejo green gray, a little bit of any light gray like stone gray from Army Painter or maybe even an off-white could be fine. You're going to have to do a little bit of testing on this to see what you like and how strong you want to be, but you do want to go up brighter than this, otherwise it's going to look a bit drab from across the table. Of course, we need to highlight the rest of the, of the uh, miniature too. So I've mixed in the amounts that I want. And this is something where, unlike a base coat or layer, we want this to be relatively thin, relatively translucent, so that our transitions from the field gray to this mixture are not so harsh. Now this looks pretty bright when it's wet because it is wet, so it's shiny. That's gonna reflect more light. But once we start applying it and then it dries, it's gonna come out not quite as bright as it looks going on. So what we wanna do is we wanna cover about 25%, maybe 30% of the miniature. The areas that especially face the sun any sharp creases in the uniform, the elbow. We want to leave any area that faces downwards as either field gray or the washed field gray. That way we maintain the illusion that this uniform is brighter up top because of the light source of the sun and it's darker on the bottom. That sleeve faces up, so it got a lot of, lot of attention. I'm gonna put a lot less down on the pants. So I would just hit on the pants. Just line here along this crease, and then line along this crease above the boot. Line here, line there. Maybe a couple of scratches for a bit of a fabric effect, but nothing major on the legs. This knee sticks out, but I don't want to go too deep because it's shadowed by the rifle. The side of the leg a little bit more because that's exposed. The bottom of the jacket is an area where you can really bring out, I kind of do the scratching motion downwards. The brush will naturally deposit more paint at the bottom of a brush stroke. So it's going to highlight the edge of his jacket more as I pull the brush down. It also leaves this kind of scratchy, streaky effect, which can help give the appearance of fabric when you're done. I'm going to finish up this, show you how it looks, and come back to talk about our final non-field gray highlights. And here is the uniform. Now, while it looks kind of dramatic on camera, on the tabletop, it is going to look better from far away. And I'll have some shots at the end of the video that show what it shows what it looks like um, at a better distance. Now, it does look like I have a lot of paints lined up here, but we're actually pretty close to the end. We're just going to be using these paints to highlight the non-field gray colors that are left on the uniform, which is, for the most part, I'm just going to take the original paint and I'm going to use the do use those to do some choice highlights with a couple of minor exceptions. So for all of the black leather, I'm gonna be using my original Necromancer cloak, but because that's already quite dark, I'm gonna mix in just a little bit of this medium gray. This is too light on its own, this is too dark on its own, mix these up a little bit. For the green band around their uh, field cap, I'm gonna use the original Goblin Green. For the skin, Barbarian Flesh. For the khaki bandolier, I'm gonna use German Camo Beige. Some of the other figures that I have like this fellow here that's got a lot more kit on him, uh, I have a couple of extra colors. For an example, to differentiate the bread bag from his, um, his bedroll here, I used skeleton bone on the bread bag. I used monster brown on the felt of the canteen. Fur brown is for the rifle, and that's on the original guy too. And I lost the leather brown. That's going to be for his brown straps. 
which are looking a little bit black under the camera, but I think that's just a lighting issue. And then finally, his little white rondelle should have a red dot in it, just a little dot of flat red in there. After that, we'll base him up in whatever scheme you want. I'm going for muddy western front, and then that's it. We'll come back and see what he looks like. And here we have it, ladies and gentlemen, the figure is done. Um, now, again, the highlights, I think, might look a little exaggerated on the video, but these are meant to play at three feet on the tabletop. So they're meant to be a little exaggerated so that they're going to look good from afar and not be too difficult to paint or spend hours and hours painting. Overall, I spent maybe a little less than an hour, maybe about 45 minutes on this figure, uh, combined with doing some other figures. Now his base is still washing, you can see uh, drying, it's still a little wet, um, but I can show you a couple of the other figures just so you can also see, while their bases are not quite done, uh, some of the other equipment that these figures come with. Um, if you're wondering, these are unfortunately out of production. I believe they are Renegade figures, World War I. You could, I pick these up on eBay, they occasionally pop up. And you do see them. They are some fantastic sculpts. Uh, compared to the War Games Atlantic plastics, they're a little chunkier. Their details are a little bit more exaggerated. And of course, they're heftier because they're metal. So some people prefer the plastics. Some people prefer the metals. Uh, I'm really indifferent. They both have their pros and cons. And that's about it. I'm going to have a couple of videos coming up in the future. Uh, highlighting World War I. Uh, both painting French, a redo of some, one of my previous videos now in actual video instead of slideshow version, um, and also some smaller scale painting of early war French, late war Germans in 10 millimeter scale, and also maybe some Russians. Until next time, keep on painting. This has been Chris.